future, I'm going to talk about my work on ergodicity for certain partially hyperbolic systems. But uh, I thought, based on Rob Sturman's lectures, people would be interested in seeing sort of these classical theorems of Anasov and others on, on say, the ergodicity of, of hyperbolic systems. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And as Gary guessed correctly, this is a picture of Stephen Smale. And uh, one famous story of Smale is in 1966, he was headed to the ICM meeting in Moscow to actually accept the Fields Medal for his work on the Poincaré conjecture. And he found out as he was going there that he was getting subpoenaed by the House Un-American Activities Commission in the States because of his work organizing Vietnam War protests. And he actually gave a uh, press conference in Moscow denouncing the, the US foreign policy. And just to be fair, he thought he should denounce the Soviet Union's foreign policy as well. So he made a lot of enemies there. And the, the, the United States Senate actually was reviewing their funding of mathematicians based on this sort of controversial press conference he gave. So in terms of mathematics funding, it's probably Smale's most relevant visit to the Soviet Union. But in terms of, in terms of dynamical systems, it isn't the most relevant visit. Because five years earlier, in 1961, uh, he went to a conference in Kiev, and there he met a promising young mathematician, Anasov. So this is Smale. And Anasov. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what year these, these photos are. <laughs> All right, so anyway, Smale at this conference, and Ossov was working in differential equations, and Smale posed this problem in qualitative dynamical systems that Ossov basically switched his entire research focus to try and answer this problem. And in doing so, he, he invented this uh, definition of what he called U systems, but what are now called the Ossov systems. And so I'm going to talk today about the question that Smale posed to Ossov and that Ossov solved which has to do with the ergodicity of these Anasov systems. So at the time, there was this notion of structural stability. Is this showing up? Uh, this notion of structural stability was really hot in dynamical systems at the time. And sort of one of the, the most famous examples of a structurally stable system was the Arnold Cat map, which I'll, I'll give a definition shortly. And the idea of it being structurally stable is you start with this cat map which is this nice linear map. And if you perturb it in the space of diffeomorphisms, nothing changes in the topological picture. So you actually have a homeomorphism conjugating your old system to the new. So in a neighborhood of the cat map, we know all there is to know about the topological nature of the dynamical system. And so Smale knew this for the topology. And his question is, what happens at the measure theoretic level? So we, we know that the cat map itself is ergodic. And the, the question Smale asked in Ossov is, is this property stable under perturbation? So if you start with the cat map and you perturb it, do you still get something which is also ergodic? And the answer is yes, and, and that's what Anasov proved. And so what is the cat map? I'll give a definition here. I just printed this off of Wikipedia. Nice. So if you start with a 2 by 2 matrix, 2, 1, 1, 1. You can think about this matrix as a linear map from R2 to R2. And if you put integers into this matrix, you get integers out. So you can quotient down by Z2. And so you get a, a, a diffeomorphism on the torus. So I'll call this A. And this is the cat map. And now looking at it as a matrix, you have two eigenvalues. So you have eigenvalues lambda, which is 3 plus root 5 over 2, which is greater than 1. And the other eigenvalue, because this is area preserving, is lambda inverse, which is less than 1. So here's the picture of you start with a square. You apply the cat map. You get this shape like this in R2, and then you quotient everything back down to this square to be defined on the torus. So it's expanding in one direction, 
here corresponding to this eigenvalue greater than 1 and contracting in the other direction. Now, sorry, they reboot everything, so I have to pull up this page again. So the reason it's called the cat map is when Arnold first drew this, he drew a picture of a cat, and he showed the effect of applying this map to the image of the cat. Okay, hopefully this will work, and I won't destroy anything. So he had some picture of a cat, and if you apply the cat map, it shears it out into these pieces. And so this is one iteration, and you can keep on applying this. So here's two iterations, three, four, five, and it's it's spreading out along this one direction, corresponding to the expanding eigenvalue. And if you keep doing this long enough, the whole picture blurs out. And in the limit, you just get one uniform color, which was the average color of the original picture. So see if I can reload this. Oops. And so I'm doing this with a, a cat, but you can do it with any picture. You can start with some function and apply this map a bunch of times, and in the image, sorry, in the limit, you get the average color of the bitmap. Or if you start with some continuous function in the limit, you get the average value of that function. And so, so, so yeah, that, that actually means something stronger than ergodic. The, what I just said, this bitmap smearing thing means that it's a mixing function. And every, so every mixing system is ergodic. So this demonstrates that it's mixing, which is a stronger property than ergodic. Not in this case, because I'm, um, it's not a discrete map. I'm actually averaging, like I take each bitmap, uh, sorry, each pixel of the bitmap, and I smear it out over four different uh, image pixels. So, and, and you can define it, you can define whatever, some function as your bitmap function, and you can look at the, the limit as you apply more iterates. And, and it's, anyway, I, I won't define mixing, but I will define ergodic, so I'll do that now. to switch back. So the start of ergodic theory is probably Birkhoff's ergodic theorem in 1931. So he looked at, uh, it's more general, but I'll just look at this specific case. Suppose you have some diffeomorphism on a manifold, and you have an invariant measure for that diffeomorphism. Then you can look at some integrable function defined on the manifold to R and define the following functions as averages. So I'm taking some point x, and there's a forward average. So I'll look at fx, f squared x, f cubed x, say. And then I can take the average of phi over all of those iterates. So this would be, say, k equals 0 to 3 of 1 over 4. So if you keep doing this going forward and take the average, you get what's called the forward Birkhoff limit. And if you do this going backwards, you get the backwards Birkhoff limit. And the amazing thing that Birkhoff proved is that these things exist almost everywhere with respect to the invariant measure. And they're equal almost everywhere, which is, is kind of surprising to me because when you're going forward, when you're going backwards, why would they be equal? But it has to do with the invariant measure. And so this is Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. It holds for any invariant measure. And then you can look at it in the specific case of an ergodic measure. So rather than use the traditional definition of ergodic, I'll, I'll give one that's equivalent here. And so with respect to this theorem, you can look at some pair f, a diffio on a manifold, and an invariant limit. And that is ergodic if every time you take these Birkhoff averages, they're constant almost everywhere. So this is equivalent to the standard definition of ergodicity. And you could do this for all integrable functions, but it's actually enough. Oh, this isn't on screen, sorry. You could do this for all integrable functions, but it's actually enough to establish ergodicity just to do this for continuous functions. 
And to show the cat map is ergodic, we're going to use this property here. OK, so we had the cat map on T2. And we had eigenvalues, lambda greater than 1 and lambda inverse less than 1. And you can look at the corresponding eigenvectors, which give you irrational, which uh, are irrationally sloped. So if you look at the two eigenvectors of this system, if you, you have these two vectors at right angles. And if you apply the dynamics, A, one of them is stretched out by this lambda. And the other one is contracted by lambda inverse. And so corresponding to the direction of contraction, you can just draw a bunch of lines at a rational slope here. And this will be what's called the stable foliation. And in terms of the direction of expansion, you can draw out another foliation of lines of constant irrational slope corresponding to this expansion. And that will give the unstable foliation. And now if you take any two points that are on, say, the same stable leaf, so suppose this is some little segment of a stable leaf. If we look at x and y, then as we apply the dynamics, this is the direction where everything is getting contracted exponentially fast. So if we apply f to the n, then these two points will be very, very close on the same stable leaf. So in writing, Showing up? Yeah. If x is in the local stable manifold of y, then the distance between f and x, f and y, is less than or equal to lambda to the minus n of x, y. And now suppose we're looking in the context of Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. And we have some phi from m to r, which is continuous. Then if we look at it at fn, x, and fn, y, this is m's a compact manifold. Specifically, it's the two torus in this example. So this is uniformly continuous. And phi fn of x minus phi fn of y is going to 0. So averaging, if we look at these, these uh, finite forward Birkhoff averages, you can prove that this is also going to 0. I'm um, sorry, this should be k. So it's not too hard to establish this. And then just taking this limit, we get that the forward Birkhoff average of x is equal to the forward Birkhoff average of y. Sorry, forward. Thanks. And so phi plus is constant on stable leaves. And if you do everything with f inverse in place of f, you get that phi minus is constant on unstable leaves. So hopefully you've figured out my color scheme. Whenever I draw something as a stable leaf, it's blue. And when I draw an unstable leaf, it's red. And so what do we have? Putting back, let's see if I can fit this all. Probably not, nope. Here. We have. We, we, we have some continuous function phi. We want to show that the Birkhoff averages, to establish ergodicity, we want to show the Birkhoff averages are, are, are constant almost everywhere. 
we have these two transverse foliations, the stable and the unstable. And the forward Birkhoff average is constant on stable leaves. The backward Birkhoff average is constant on unstable leaves. And they agree almost everywhere. So intuitively, it, it should hold that both of these things are constant. But there's a little bit of subtlety in proving this, so I'll actually go through and do it. And there's, there's a big subtlety in proving this when you don't look at the cat map and you actually look at a general and Ossov map. So I'll look at a, where are we here? A rectangle R, by which I mean I'm just going to take some small section of the manifold uh, between two unstable leaves and two stable leaves. So in the, the torus for the cat map, this is just literally a rectangle rotated at some angle. Um, you can also define a similar thing for a general Anosov system when I get to those. Uh, but for now, just for the cat map, if we have something like this, then we can talk about a good set G. And so this is a good set with respect to Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. So we've fixed some phi from M to R, and now we get a good set G where X is in G if the forward and, Birkhoff, uh, forward and backward Birkhoff averages exist and are equal. So by the ergodic theorem, G has full measure in R. So we have some full measure subset here in this rectangle R of good points. And now we can apply Fubini's theorem that there exists some L, some stable segment. I'll draw it in here. So this is my L, such that Yeah, so inside the rectangle, you have, for the cat map, just total linear foliation here, transverse linear foliation there. It's at a right angle, actually, for the cat map. Um, I'm proving that phi plus and phi minus are constants almost everywhere. So I have. Yeah, sorry, yeah, I, sorry, I'm not proving Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. I'm assuming for the entire talk that Birkhoff's ergodic theorem is true. Uh, yes. Yeah, so phi plus and phi minus are equal almost everywhere. I want to show that they are equal to a given constant almost everywhere. Which, and the constant will actually be the average value of phi. Okay, so we have this full measure subset G. And because of Fubini's theorem, if you have some full measure subset of a square, then on every sort of vertical segment, or almost every vertical segment, it has to intersect that in full measure. So if that holds for almost every segment, then it certainly holds for one of them. So there is some stable segment L, such that G intersects L in a set of full one-dimensional measure. All right, so here is our big set G intersect L. And now I'm going to define a new set Z as just taking the unstable manifold through these points in G intersect L. So for everything in G intersect L, I'll just take the entire unstable manifold. And now, the 2D measure of this, when you're just saturating in this linear direction, uh, will be the full measure. So if we have a full measure subset G intersect L, and then we just saturate out linearly in the other direction, then we get a full measure subset of the rectangle. So, 
So in this case, L is just the segment of the stable leaf crossing through the rectangle. So this has full measure in R. Um, for what I'm going to do next, I want a stable leaf. But it, yeah, I mean, the question is, yeah, you can ask the question for general transversals. And now I'll argue that if x and y are in this new set z, then their backward Birkhoff average coincides. Question? No, it's not at all obvious. It's, so going back to Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. So this is, this is the conclusion of Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. And it's, it's very difficult to prove. Well, I don't know if it's very difficult, but it's not obvious. Like, if you could sit there on a pad of paper and try and prove Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, but it, you, I don't know, maybe you would, but I certainly wouldn't be able to, to prove it. It's, it's a very deep theorem. There, it's, it's purely... Uh, measurable, actually. So you need any measure-preserving transformation, then, then this holds. The forward limit exists, and the backward limit exists almost everywhere, and the two coincide almost everywhere. Yeah, in the case of ergodicity, yeah, the, the, they'll, they'll both be equal to the same constant almost everywhere. So here I'll show this claim. So where's my rectangle? I'll draw this again. I already know that almost, so G, almost every point is in G. Uh, yes, good in the sense of the backward average, yeah. I'm saying precisely, so I'm saying precisely this. I have this rectangle, and I have a full measure subset of the rectangle, so that so that the backwards Birkhoff averages coincide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's say this is my x in z, and this is my y in z. And so I want to show that these averages coincide. Let me draw the other unstable manifolds. So here's the unstable manifold through x, and the unstable manifold through y. And then we started all of this with some special stable segment L. And because we're in this small rectangle, everything intersects nicely. And so I get two new points, P and Q. And now by the very definition of Z, this P has to be in our original good set G, as with Q. OK, so now let's go through and, and, and do this. So here's phi minus of x. And now x and p are on the same unstable manifold. And so they have the same past in some sense. That means that their backwards Birkhoff averages coincide. So phi minus of x is equal to phi minus of p. And now p is in the good set with respect to the Birkhoff ergodic theorem. 
So phi minus of p is equal to phi plus of p. And then p and q are on the same stable leaf. And so their futures coincide in some sense. In particular, their forward Birkhoff average is the same. And now Q is in G, so its forward and backward Birkhoff averages coincide. And then finally, Q is on the same unstable leaf as Y, so phi minus of Q equals phi minus of Y. So this claim holds. We have this full measure subset of the rectangle so that phi minus is, is constant on that subset. So we've shown that phi minus is constant almost everywhere on R. And so this is some small rectangle, but we could cover our entire compact manifold with these rectangles. And they'll, they'll overlap in sets of positive measure. So it's not too hard to show, in fact, that phi minus is constant almost everywhere on the entire manifold, which would be the two torus for the cap map. And that's what we wanted to show. This is constant almost everywhere, and it's equal to phi plus almost everywhere. So we've started with some general continuous function. We've shown that it's constant. Uh, sorry, starting with some general continuous function of phi, we've shown that the forward and backward Birkhoff averages are constant almost everywhere. And so that's enough to conclude that uh, this map is ergodic in the specific case of the cap map. That says conclude, if you believe me. All right. So Um, yeah, so locally, you have these stable and unstable directions that are transverse. So you always have a path, but the question is the measure, because this Birkhoff zergotic theorem only holds on a set of full measure, right? So you have to be careful if P and Q weren't in the good set with respect to the Birkhoff ergodic theorem, you couldn't do this argument. So, uh, so P was the same thing essentially, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, no. So, so phi plus and phi minus are constant almost everywhere, but they certainly won't be constant for the entire set. So you can imagine, uh, like if you take a periodic point, then the Birkhoff, forward Birkhoff averages and backwards Birkhoff averages are determined purely by the, the, the values on that periodic orbit. So it won't be the average value of the function. So it is truly almost everywhere. You want Birkhoff's theorem? No, no, starting point is your argument. Okay. So I started with a continuous function. I have this good set where, where Birkhoff's ergodic theorem holds. The forward and backward averages are the same. And, and so the forward and backward averages are the same almost everywhere. And then by the, by the actual dynamics, by the contraction and expansion, One's constant on stable leaves and one's constant on unstable leaves. So the key question is, the key question <laughs> So the key question is the absolute continuity of the foliation. So if you have a foliation in, in some region of your space and you have a full measure set, does that mean it intersects almost every leaf in a set of full measure? That's, that's the key thing here. And that's, that's the, the big insight that Anasov had in proving this thing when we perturb. Um, it could just not hold. You could have, there's, 
There are foliations, not in the Anosov case, well, in certain Anosov cases, you can certainly define a foliation that uh, intersects a full measure set in each leaf. You can define a, you can define a, a foliation so that each leaf is smooth, but there's a full measure set that intersects each leaf in exactly one point. These things actually exist. There's these crazy pathological counterexamples in dynamics. And so, I mean, right now we just have this linear foliation for the cat map. So it's, everything looks pretty obvious, right? You just have standard Fubini theorem. But there's, there's a paper, I think the name is Fubini foiled, where you actually see these crazy foliations. And I mean, like in my study of partial hyperbolicity, this is, this is the normal thing to expect. In, in partially hyperbolic dynamics, you get crazy pathological foliations all the time. Yeah, let me, let me state this precisely, since people seem to be curious. So there is a foliation of, let's say, the square So this is a C0 foliation. You, you have a continuous change of coordinates into something vertical. Each leaf is C infinity. And there is a full measure subset x such that each leaf intersects x in one point. <laughs> so you can have these pathologies. Right? So, so Fabini's theorem in general doesn't hold. Now x is the full measure subset. So this square, call this square R. Yeah, and there's, I may as well include this. I think it's Milner in the Mathematical Intelligencer has a, a beautiful write-up of how this works. And it's based on an example of Katak that occurred in dynamics. All right, so that was the ergodicity of the cat map. And as I said, here, once you go off of these nice linear foliations, you get these issues where, where Fubini's theorem in general doesn't hold. And so the big insight of Katak, sorry, not Katak, the, the big insight of Anosov is to establish for these perturbations of the cat map that you still have some kind of absolute continuity, that you can do this nice Fubini argument. All right, I'll just do this. this. So the question is, what happens when we perturb the system, as I said? So if you perturb A, the cat map is what's known as an Anosov diffeomorphism. And Anosov diffeomorphisms form an open subset of diffeos. So every time you perturb it, you get something that's also Anosov. And the definition is here. So you, you start with a diffeomorphism on a compact manifold. It's an Ossov if there's some number lambda greater than 1 and a splitting of the tangent bundle into two pieces. So at each point x, the tangent space splits into an unstable subspace and a stable subspace. So you get, in fact, a continuous splitting into an unstable subbundle and a stable subbundle. And if you take any vector in the unstable direction, then the action of the derivative is to expand this vector. So it expands by at least this lambda greater than 1. So you have exponential expansion as you iterate forward for the unstable direction. And then if you start with a stable vector, then as you go forward, it's exponentially contracted. 
And you can see this in the cat map because we just have the splitting into the eigen directions. We have an eigenvalue greater than 1. So every, every vector in, in that eigen direction is expanded exponentially as we go forward. And we have an eigenvalue less than 1. Sorry? Yeah, and, and it's a consequence. It's a consequence of the uh, of the definition. It, it takes a bit of work to prove, but you can show that every time you have this infinitesimal condition for the Anosov diffeomorphism, then you get these stable foliations and unstable foliations. Which, which ergodic property? So the, yep. Oh, so you're asking if you take a if you take a general perturbation, right? So, so for a Nosov systems, I'm not entirely sure. If it's so, what I'm going to get to is a Nosov's proof. If if your Nosov system is C2, so it's twice continuously differentiable, then everything's nice. You get nice foliations. If your Nosov is only C1, then there are counterexamples by Young and Robinson that I'll talk about at the end. Um, where you get pathologies. You get, you get these foliations that aren't absolutely continuous. You get the, these weird Fubini theorem doesn't work kind of things. Oh, I haven't defined it yet. I'll do that. <laughs> so with the cat map, we had these nice stable and unstable foliations that were perfectly linear. And so, of course, Fubini's theorem works. And you can show, and Anosov actually proved this in this setting, if you perturb and get some f near a, then you still have this splitting. And tangent to the stable and unstable directions, you get these foliations. But now the leaves are smooth, but the foliation itself may not be smooth. Um, C1 small perturbations. So you can change, you can move points by some distance epsilon, and you can change the first derivative by some distance epsilon. That's, yeah. And so we get these foliations again. And if you, if you took two points on the same stable leaf, you still have this exponential contraction as you go forward. So points are on the same stable leaf, are still shrunk together exponentially fast. And because of this, we have the property that we had before. Phi plus in the Birkhoff ergodic theorem is constant on stable leaves. And phi minus the backward Birkhoff average is constant. and unstable leaves. And so the proof we had before let me just pull it up again. This rectangle this proof uh, would work if we have some sort of Fubini theorem for the foliations. So there's two questions. One is if you have some full measure set in a rectangle does the stable leaf intersect that full measure set in a set of full measure? Sorry, that was like a tongue twister almost. So if you have this perturbed picture, let's see. If you have this perturbed picture now, and you have your good set G,
the full measure. Does G intersect a stable segment? So one of these blue lines on the rectangle in full measure. So we don't know in general. And for certain C1 and OSOF systems, it's actually false. G, sorry, G is the, the good set for the, for the Birkhoff average of, of F, my perturbed system. Yeah. So Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. Yeah, it's G. OK, so it's G of F, let's say. Yeah. So, and I mean, you can talk about this for a general in OSOF. You still have Birkhoff zergotic theorem holds. So this is the good set of Birkhoff zergotic theorem. And then the other question is, given G intersect L, so if we had some segment L, and we had some full measure set G intersect L of full measure, does the unstable saturate of this thing. So if we take all of the unstable leaves through this point, I'm just drawing a mess here. Does this thing have full measure? Yeah, yeah. In full, absolutely. In full one dimensional yes yeah absolutely so it's an open question yeah you're, you're coming you're, you're skipping to the, you're skipping to the end of the talk so so what what an Osov, I'll, I'll say it now though what an Osov proved is you start with the cat map you perturb if your perturbation is C2, then it's ergodic still. But it's an open question. If you perturb and now you have a C1, if you have a C1 diffio close to the cat map, that's an open question whether that is ergodic or not. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so both of these questions are basically the same question, and they come down to the absolute continuity of the foliation. So we can repeat all of our arguments for the cat map. If the stable, and similarly, the unstable foliations are absolutely continuous. Uh, like this. It's a mess. And so what does this mean? So I'll define absolute continuity of the foliation in terms of transversals. So now I'm going to rotate things slightly. I'll draw the unstable manifolds like this. And so imagine you have two close unstable manifolds for an Anosov system. And then between all of the points, we can draw a stable leaf from the one unstable manifold to the other. So given a point x, we can just follow along the stable manifold till we hit a point y on the other unstable segment. And I'll call this hs of x. So this defines a map HS from the local unstable manifold of x to the local unstable manifold of y. And now what I want to show is that HS is absolutely continuous. And so what does that mean if I take some subset capital X here, then I want that the, the measure of capital X on this curve, so the one-dimensional measure, is equal to 0 if and only if its image, hs of x, is equal to 0. And so if you can establish this, you can actually go through and repeat all of the proof of ergodicity from before. So this is the big argument. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, the holonomy in general won't be conservative, no. Like, we're, we're talking about a, uh, an area preserving diffeomorphism, but the, but the holonomy itself won't, in general, it won't take a, a, it won't preserve the measure of one, one subset of an unstable segment map to another unstable segment. Uh, just Lebesgue measure. So we can imagine we're in dimension two. The argument I'll give will work for any dimension, but you can just think that we're in a two-dimensional system and both of these unstable segments are one-dimensional. What's that? Yeah, sorry, M is Lebesgue, yeah. Yeah, and in fact, sorry, I don't think I said it explicitly, but I'm just assuming Lebesgue measure for my only measure. This, the, the argument actually works in some other settings in a limited case, but for simplicity, you just think Lebesgue measure for everything. Okay, so how do, we, how do we show that this is absolutely continuous? So the idea is to approximate WS, which is our stable foliation, by a smooth foliation, which I'll call W naught. And then, so this is, this is stable holonomy here. This map is a stable holonomy. And now I'll just define. So holonomy is starting at this point on the one un unstable segment. You just follow the stable leaf across to the other one. So HS is, the, the map HS is a stable holonomy, which just means starting at any point here, you just follow the stable leaf to get its image. The absolute continuity of the stable direction? Yeah. 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 So, so now you say that I can Yeah. So the existence, yeah, the existence of a foliation follows from being an Ossov. You have to prove that. It's and I didn't go into any of that detail, but you, yeah. Yeah. So, so if you have an Anasov diffeomorphism, you have these stable and unstable foliations, always. And then, whenever you have a foliation and two transversals, you can define this holonomy, just going along leaves. And it'll be continuous, but the big question is, is it, is it absolutely continuous? So, um, we don't know anything about the stable holonomy at first, so what we'll do is approximate it by, by holonomies of a smooth foliation, and those because the foliation is smooth, see it. Because yeah, um, <laughs> the foliation is smooth, we'll have uh, smooth holonomies, and then using those smooth holonomies, we'll prove that the the limit, H S, is absolutely continuous. So H naught is holonomy by W naught, and then I'll define H N to be, instead of doing the holonomy here, first I'll apply f to the n. I'll do the holonomy along w naught, and then I'll come back by f to the minus n. No, we don't know. In, for, for a general Anasov, we don't know that the stable foliation is smooth. In fact, it isn't. The system, so f itself is C2 but it doesn't follow that the foliations are C2 smooth. We, 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 know they, sorry, we know they exist and that they're continuous in general. They're hurled or continuous in general, actually. Yeah. So it's a graph transform argument, and I'm, sort of, I'm trying to focus on the ergodicity, so I didn't go into that detail. So the idea, you want to map x by this hn, you apply f to the n, and now this unstable segment is expanded 
exponentially as we apply f to the n. So we get some super long, big, unstable segment here. And the other unstable segment is also expanded. And all of these stable segments connecting them are contracted exponentially fast. So if we apply f to the n to this image, we have these two unstable segments that are very close to each other. And now the idea is, since they're very close to each other, it doesn't actually matter if we go straight across by the stable foliations. We can approximate it down here, and any sort of error we make um, is diminished when we apply f to the minus n. So instead of going, here's, my, here's x, and here's f to the n of x, and now I go across by some holonomy, by this h naught, f to the n and the x, and there's some error involved in that, but as we apply f to the minus n, this unstable segment is shrunk down exponentially fast. So this error actually is shrunk exponentially, and we get a point yn, which is hn of x. And is this big enough? You can show, I won't do it, but you can show that hn converges uniformly to, sorry, to HS, the actual stable foliation. And so this is uniform convergence in the sense of topology, in a C0 sense. But what we want is to prove absolute continuity. So we need to know something about um, the derivatives involved. Yep. Uh, uniform convergence. So these, these holonomies HN, defined from the one segment to the other, converge uniformly to the actual stable holonomy. Hmm? No, I didn't use any smoothness here. Yeah. No, you, it can be a bijection, absolutely. So you can take, like, you could take a Cantor set that has zero measure, and you can map it to a Cantor set that has positive measure. And you could, just, you could actually just take your two favorite Cantor sets of zero measure and positive measure, and then just linearly map one to the other. So you can define a continuous foliation that maps a zero set to a set of positive measure. Um, so, so I suggested just doing it linearly, so every leaf would be straight if you just defined a map that way. Hmm? <laughs> Not quite vertical, yeah. What did I, so what did I just suggest here? <laughs> so my suggestion was take a Cantor set, take a Cantor set x naught, where the measure of x naught equals zero, and then take another Cantor set x whatever, x1, where the measure of x1 is 0 0.1. It can be anything less than 1. So here are your two sets. And then you have a bunch of intervals where you just map everything completely linearly in each interval. And you'll get your holonomy, because you're just mapping along these straight lines, is just the map that takes a zero measure Cantor set to a positive measure Cantor set. So it is entirely possible. All right, so I'll put this back for a second. Um, so here's, here's HN again. And what I'll do is let JHN be the radon Nicodyme derivative of Hn. And so if we're a smooth function, the radon Nicodyme derivative is just at some point, you take some tiny set, you map it forward, you see what the change is in the measure. If you have a smooth function, it's just the, the determinant of the Jacobian or the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian. But in general, if it's just an absolutely continuous map, 
this will exist, and it, but it won't be it won't be the actual C1 derivative. It'll just be some function that says if you take a small measurable set here, what happens to the measure? And it holds. So we know HN converges uniformly to HS, and now if if the limit of GHN exists and converges uniformly. I think I need this. Then the rate on Nicodym derivative of JS itself exists. And it's equal to this limit here. So to show HS is absolutely continuous, All we need to do is calculate these derivatives, which are just actual derivatives, because the HNs are smooth, calculate these derivatives and show that this limit exists. So what was my map again? Let's see. This is big. I'll use this. So HN is defined as F to the minus N, composed with the holonomy along this smooth approximation of the stable foliation, composed with F to the N. And so by the chain rule, the Jacobian of HN at some point X is the Jacobian of FN at some point YN, which depends on N, times Jacobian of H naught at Fn x times the Jacobian of Fn at x. Now we can, I'll, I'll write this out in front because we're just, these are just real numbers, so we can um, multiply them in any order. Fn x, and then expanding out this f to the n, again by the chain rule, you get this product like this. So k equals 0 to n minus 1, jf, fk at, so this is Jacobian at fk x, and this is the Jacobian at fk yn. And a note, because what we're doing is we're looking at sets on these unstable leaves, and we're applying f to the n on the unstable leaf, what I'm saying here by jf is actually the derivative, or the radon nicodyme derivative, for the restriction to the unstable direction. So it's a, it's a subtle point, but it's, that's what I mean by this JF here. Now, for our original holonomy, if I can bring it up again, for the original holonomy, I have x. And I'm going along the stable leaf to get to y. So these things are on the same stable segment. As we apply f to go forward, they'll be contracted exponentially fast. So dfkx, dfky is less than lambda to the minus k, say. k is greater than 0, and this is contracting. Lambda is greater than 1. And so, because I'm approximating HS by HN, I get this point YN, which was my image of X. And these things are converging to the actual value of Y. You can show that this holds as well. That the distance between FKX and FKYN is again less than lambda to the minus K independent of this actual value n, as long as it's sufficiently large. All right, and now, here comes the critical reason why we need to know that the function itself is C2. So if f is C2, then the derivative, 
df, or the Jacobian jf, is Lipschitz, right? It's a C1 function, so in particular, it's Lipschitz. And it's not too hard to see from that that the log of jf is also Lipschitz. Um, what do you mean? Yeah, yeah, let me pull that up again, sorry. So here is my picture. Put this down here. Let's see, it's possible to get everything on the screen all the time. So yeah, what's happening is I'm going from fnx to its image under h0. So this, this thing is equivalent to f, fn of what I called yn there. And because these two unstable leaves are uniformly close, the distance between fnx and fnyn is very close. It's shrinking exponentially fast. So I'm defining, sorry, yn is defined. yn is defined as hn of x, so it actually, these two things are equal. So if we have a C2 function, then log jf is Lipschitz. And now I'll write out this thing. Is that still on screen? No. I'll write out the logarithm of this. So taking the log, this product becomes a sum. log jf xkx, log jf fk yn. Sorry, I hope that shows up. And now fkx and fk yn are shrinking together exponentially fast. The distance between these was less than this lambda to the minus k. So using this Lipschitz property, this is less than equal to the sum of L lambda to the minus k from k equals 0 to n minus 1. And this is some finite part of some convergent infinite series. So this is just some power series, so it converges. So this is the critical point. If you didn't have this C2 assumption, you couldn't prove that the series converged. And so you wouldn't be able to prove much of anything. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I've lost my last page. <laughs> yeah, OK. So this was JHN. We had this thing that I show converges as n goes to infinity. And then as n goes to infinity, this is the holonomy H0 between two points that are shrinking together exponentially fast. So this holonomy is getting, it's a holonomy over a smaller and smaller distance, so you can actually show that this part tends to 1 in the limit as n goes to infinity. So what you're left with, all told, is that the limit jhn is equal to this infinite product jf fkx over jf fky, where y is actually the holonomy. And so this limit exists, um, and it converges uniformly. So you can show that this thing is converging to the radon dikodnib derivative of the stable holonomy. So HS has, has a radon nicodyme derivative, and it's absolutely continuous. And this was the big, 
uh, critical thing needed to show that the stable, I mean this is equivalent to saying that the stable foliation is absolutely continuous. So Fubini's theorem holds. And we can just apply all of those arguments we used for the cat map again to show that F is ergodic. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I didn't I didn't do that, but it, everything's totally symmetric. Uh, so so this shows that the Yeah. Yeah. So you sw yeah, you switch f with f inverse and you prove again that you prove again that wu as well is absolutely continuous. So if you have something that's absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue, then it has a radon nicodyme derivative almost everywhere, and that's and it's if and only if. So if something's absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue if and only if it has this radon nicodyme derivative defined everywhere. So this this actual technique you have to go through and prove it. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm sure Inosov's not the first one to prove this, but it might be in his paper. It's also in some other ergodicity papers in the field. But if you if you can show that HN converges uniformly to H, and its, its uh, Jacobians, or its radon nicodyme derivatives, converge uniformly to some limit, then you get that the resulting holonomy is absolutely continuous. It's, it's the problem that, I mean, provided you kind of need that your, your measure Yeah. Right? Yes. Um, so I'd say what I'm proving is that you have these two you have your two unstable leaves and you're going across right you start with some set here X and you're going across by the stable leaves and the, the idea in some sense is that if you're going across here it's hard to say what's going on but what you can do is apply F to the N and then you, you stretch out this set X. You stretch out this set X. And then your holonomy is very small, right? You're only going some tiny, tiny little distance. And so it doesn't really matter if you make tiny errors here. They'll all be, the errors will be shrunk down when you apply F to the minus N again. And so the idea is that if you want to know what the derivative, the radon nicodyme derivative is of this holonomy, all you have to do is look at what's happening with f to the n here and f to the minus n here. That's the important part because if you go down here, you're just doing this tiny little holonomy and the way you do that isn't as important. And so that's why, where did my formula go? That's why this formula is the formula of the radon nicodyme derivative of the stable holonomy. It has everything to do with what f is doing on the unstable leaves and, and in the limit, nothing to do with the actual tiny little yeah. holonomy along the stable. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you some yep. So I assume some different things. Uh, so when you, why did you have this uh, product? So it, it was before. Uh, which so which product? This one here? No, yeah, even, even, even uh, up. No, oh, I don't know where up is anymore. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yep. And it is very simple. Yeah. Even up. Even more. Also, it's previous page. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. This I'll is how I. So, so it's previous page. Sorry. Oh, yep. This, this, so, why this uh, product is three is equal to this uh, product of k from 0 to n minus 1? Probably something very. Here? Yeah. So, 
so it's the chain rule from first to second is the chain rule and then and then these these radon naked dime derivatives are just real numbers, so I can move them around. I can move the middle one to the front, which is what I did. And then I just apply the chain rule again to expand out the other ones. Yeah. So you have applied the chain rule again and again. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, so another thing, so why uh, you have uh, uh, that uh, the difference between uh, F, K, F, and F? So, so you know that Yeah. Why did it go for Y M, which uh, for M is larger than K? Um, yeah, N will be larger than K. Right. Yeah. Why, so, why? so what are you doing? You're going. You have these two unstable leaves yeah. that are shrunk together exponentially fast. Yeah. And so you have some approximation, right? So you're down here, and you have some approximation, and it may be maybe you're doing Y N, and this, this. This whole manifold is the image under f to the k. But they're still close. So all of these holonomies are, are very close to each other. And so the, the, the key argument is that the two unstable segments are uniformly close to each other. It's, I mean, I, I, I could, you so want to talk about afterwards. It's smooth for bringing it together, right? It's yeah. It's the moment that I like this, sorry, that's just a theory that I made this right. <laughs> Well, you don't make, in general, it's not smooth. I mean, in, in the two-dimensional case, it is. It's C1. But in general, for a general Anosov, you only show that it's absolutely continuous. And it is not a smooth holonomy in general. Because why is it defined by Fn half higher than K? So for me, uh, may, 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 maybe you can, I don't know, at least figure out. So, yeah, so you're applying some approximate holonomy here. But the approximations are all close enough to the stable that it doesn't matter, that they're going on these segments. All right. Well, people are sneaking out, so perhaps I should end it there. Yes. So maybe I should state what I proved. Sure. It might be a good thing to end with. So this is an Ossov's theorem. If you have some C2, so twice continuously differentiable function, it's measure preserving and a Nosov, according to that definition, then it's ergodic by that argument. And then, as I mentioned before, Robinson and Young looked at the C1 case. So if you have a function that's only C1, then this whole argument, establishing absolute continuity of the foliations, doesn't work at all. And so it's, but it's still an open question. They proved that the foliations were not absolutely continuous, but it's an open question whether stable ergodicity holds in the C1 setting. So if you have some arbitrary C1 diffeomorphism close to the cap map, is it ergodic? All right, I'll, this yep. From this is Clark Robinson at Northwestern, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.